How's everybody doing today? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Our second presentation, multi-stage rocket system. I'll turn it over to Doug Lee, project manager. Thank you, Dr. Benavides. Welcome, everybody. We're very happy that you're here today with us. My name is Gan He Lee. I'm the product manager of Emperor Aerospace. Today, we'll be presenting our preliminary design view for the multi-stage rocket system. On the agenda today is our mission objectives and constraints, the mission background, concept of operations, system definition, propellant introduction, as well as our system-by-system -system definition validation sequence. We'll have our stage one system, stage two system, payload fairing system, and we'll wrap it all up with a system of system validation. We'll have a question and answer session at the end. Our team management consists of myself, the product manager, and Blake Gaines, the assistant product manager. Our mission objectives are derived from a request for proposal by the customer in which the system was to be comp comprised of a first stage, second stage, and payload fairing. Our system of system should also be unguided, recoverable, and reusable. What that means for us is that we have no active control system, and our rocket will be able to fly again with minimal, minimal input from the design team afterwards. Our altitude objectives are tiered in primary, secondary, and tertiary objectives. Our primary are required for mission success, our secondary are expected for mission success, and our tertiary are desired for mission success. Our altitude window for our primary objectives are 5,700 meters to 6,300 meters. Secondary objective, it's 8,700 meters to 9,300 meters. And lastly, our tertiary objectives are 11,000 meters, excuse me, 11,700 meters to 12,300 meters. It's important to note that we've designed our entire system for our tertiary objective altitude altitudes. Our mission constraints are that the system of systems will have a budget less than or equal to $1,550. The system of systems will have to abide by the FAA regulations surrounding the use of uh, amateur rockets. The system of systems will also have to abide by the launch site regulations, in this case the Tripoli Phoenix launch site uh, regulations. And lastly, we'll have a total impulse less than or equal to 5,120 newton 5 newton seconds. We'll like to have our system fully validated by April 15, 2018. A brief introduction to the launch site. We'll be launching at an area called Aguila, Arizona. It's roughly about an hour and a half, two hours from here. Uh, it's an area that's very, relatively flat and open. The scene depicted here is uh, very representative of the area. It makes it re really easy for recovery and launch. Some specifics to the launch site. There's a FAA waiver, which will refer to the temporary flight restriction. It's a six kilometer radius with an altitude of about 15 kilometers in height. I'd like to talk a little bit about our mission background and benefits at this point. Uh, in support of the design of this rocket, our system has developed an ex a, ro a robust rocket simulator through extensive modeling and simulation. This model includes an aerodynamic model, a propulsion model, and a recovery model, as well as a uh, heat transfer thermodynamics model. It's important to note that this model has uh, significant advantages towards compared to what's available on the market right now, commercially and open source. We deal away with a lot of the assumptions and approximations in those uh, sequences. We'd like to validate our model through our experimental test flight you're going to have a significant avionics payload on board, which would uh, give us tracking information and telemetry information about our flight. Should this model be fully validated, it would be a very powerful design tool available for future missions, as well as follow setting a conceptual framework for future missions. Our design overview consists of our first stage at the very bottom here in orange. Our next stage is right on top of that, that's also powered. And lastly, our payload fairing segment is right on top of that. It's important to know that all three of these segments are modular independent, meaning they have their own systems and their flight control, excuse me, they're all modular segments with their own avionics bays and parachutes. Here's a simulation of our ascent. This is, this is going to go very quickly. The first stage burns out within three seconds, so just be ready for that. So we've got first stage ejection and stage two ignition right here. You can notice that we're very stable here. We stabilize, with it, we stabilize at an initial attitude after launch, and we maintain that stability configuration throughout the rest of our duration. Our combined burn time is around six or seven seconds, and we spend about 40 seconds coasting to apogee, which is what you're seeing right here. There's some significant precession that begins to develop as we get closer and closer towards apogee, which we're expecting. The rocket's attitude begins to pitch over as we get closer and closer to apogee here. Alrighty. Our concept of operations goes as follows. We begin with the launch of the rocket with a stage one ignition. About three seconds later, the stage one is, uh, stage one burns out and is ejected from the system of systems. Stage two ignition begins. Stage two burns out around three seconds after that, and we spend around 40 seconds coasting with the payload fairing and stage two still attached towards their mutual apogee. At apogee sometime later, the systems are separated, the payload fairing and stage two. They deploy their parachutes in a partial deployment configuration. 
Sometime later at a lower altitude, they go to a full, full deployment configuration. Lastly, the rocket segments are recovered on the ground by the design team. Some important uh, definitions here is that the flight duration is the time at which a rocket segment is launched, the, at the time at which it impacts the ground. The mission duration is the time at which the rocket segment is launched and is recovered by the design team. And lastly, a separation event is the time at which a segment is ejected from another segment. For example, a stage one separation event is outlined in step two right here, where stage one is no longer part of the entire system. At this point, I'd like to invite Blake Games to discuss our system definition. Thank you, Gunny. Hi, everyone. My name is Blake Games, and I'll be going over our system definition. First, I'd like to introduce the members of our integration team. We have Tyler Noland and Kyle Noland. And at this time, I'm going to invite Kyle up to help me show you all our mock-up. So first, here's a look at our design structure tree. You've heard Gandhi talk a little bit about our MSRS. We will be going through our stage one, our stage two, our payload fairing, and our ground station. First, we have our stage one system. The purpose of the stage one system is to launch our rocket off the ground and get it up to an altitude at which the stage two can then take over and eventually get our payload fairing up to our desired mission altitude. The entire rocket, or the entire body will be made out of fiberglass. It comes out to be approximately 82 mil centimeters in length. It has an inner diameter of 54 millimeters and an outer di diameter of 59 millimeters. The entire mass of the stage will come out to be about 3.31 kilograms and the motor's impulse will be 2,800 newton seconds. Here's a look at our interstage coupler. The interstage coupler will be made out of aluminum and the, per the point of the coupler is to tra transition our rocket's body diameter from, down from a 40, 54 millimeter diameter down to a 38 millimeter diameter. It fits into the first stage like so. And after page stage one parachute ejection, it'll be return, retained to the system by being attached to our shock cord. Next, we have our stage two system. The purpose of our stage two system is to launch our, uh, get our payload up to our desired mission altitude. The entire length of the stage two system will come out to be about 88 centimeters long. It has an outer diameter of 42 millimeters and an inner diameter of 38 millimeters. The mass of the system will be about 1.42 kilograms and the stage's motor will have an impulse of 1100 newton seconds. This is a look at our stage two coupler. Notice on the center of it, it has a support ring. This is to keep the coupler from sliding back into the stage two during ascent. And then the payload fairing will sit on top and it fits into the stage two like so. Finally, we have a payload fairing. The purpose of the payload fairing is to reach our mission's altitude and to carry our scientific payload. The payload fairing in length is about 43 centimeters long. It has an inner diameter of 38 millimeters and an outer diameter of 42 millimeters. The mass will be about half a kilogram and it will not have any motor in this part. So this is a look at our total system systems. The entire rocket length comes out to be about 219 centimeters long. The entire rocket will have about a mass of 5.24 kilograms, and the total impulse of the rocket will come out to be just over 4,000 newton seconds. Now we'll have a look at our ground station. The purpose of the ground station is that it should initiate the launch of our MSR system systems and it should keep our rocket vertical at the launch. This here is our launch pad. It consists of a base down at the bottom and it has outer, an outer cage and then it has inner guide rods that can be adjusted to the diameter of the rocket. And now I'll pass it over to Kyle to tell you more about the ground station and our propellant. Thank you, Blake. Hello, I'm Kyle Nolan, and I'll be talking more about the ground station system. The ground station system has two subsystems, the, uh, the launch tower that we have over here, and the stage one ignition control. The stage one ignition control will be wired to a safe distance away from the rocket, and will be used to ignite the stage one propellant to launch the rocket. 
The launch tower we have here was designed and built by the PAL Senior Design Team in 2015. And it has the, so a few important dimensions of a height of 2.8 meters and an inner diameter that's variable that can match the outer diameter of our rocket. Its purpose is to hold the rocket vertical uh, before launch and also to keep it vertical for the initial parts of our acceleration. Next I'll talk about the propellant that we'll be using. The propellant that we chose is an ammonium perchlorate and aluminum power double powder double base mixture. We chose it because it has a high specific impulse compared to other solid fuels. It has minimal cracking and erosion properties, which can cause uneven thrust and uh, high pressure spikes. And it's also been used on the Embry-Riddle campus before in previous tests, and we have data from the, those tests. Uh, the major constituents are ammonium perchlorate, aluminum powder, and hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, or HTPB. It also includes binding agents, which are used to hold the propellant together. It's important to note that we'll be using the same propellant on both stage one and stage two. These are the, the propellant characteristics that we want uh, from our propellant. Uh, we have the characteristic exhaust velocity, which is a measure of the combustion efficiency of the fuel. And then we also have uh, burden rate coefficient and exponents that will determine how much thrust we'll be producing and how quickly the propellant burns. Uh, we also want a density of about 1,700 kilograms per meter cube, which is important for our uh, mass model of the rocket. We determine these based off of the performance necessary for the thrust curves of our dynamic simulation model. Uh, we plan to validate and characterize the propellant experimentally at a later date. The grain geometry we plan to use is a multi-grain geometry, and it will combine a regressive and progressive uh, propellant grain, which will create a bimodal thrust distribution. Here we have the uh, progressive grain we'll be using. It's a Bates, or Ballistic Test and Evaluation System grain. And it will produce a progressive burn starting at a low initial thrust and going to a high thrust at the end of the burn. It has a burn, this grain shown here has a burn time of about 2.8 seconds. And for our regressive burn, we'll be using a Finisil grain, which has a regressive curve starting with a high thrust that gradually reduces over the course of the burn. Uh, this is a plot of a, the same outer diameter of a propellant grain and has a burn, much shorter burn time of about 1.4 seconds. By linearly interposing them, we can create a, our bimodal thrust distribution with the regressive curve here in blue and the progressive curve here in green and our total curve here in black. Uh, it's important to note that we've made some assumptions for these, this model. We assumed a constant chamber pressure for the whole burn, and we assumed that we can linearly interpose these uh, grains. We plan to improve the accuracy of our grain model simulation through experimentation <coughs> with the propellant at a later date, and we also plan to refine the propellant characteristics with that experimentation. Uh, next, uh, Jacob Meyer will talk about the stage one system definition. Thanks, Kyle. My name is Jacob Meyer, and I'll be going over the stage one system definition. Working with me on this was Joseph Mena. So first, I'd like to go over a quick concept of operations for stage one. So first, the system will launch. Quickly after that, stage one will burn out, and immediately, we will have the stage one separation event. Stage one will coast to its apogee, where it will deploy its main chute, and finally, it will coast to landing. A note on the stage one separation event. So it's actually composed of a couple of different parts. First, stage one will actually separate from stage two with a black powder charge. Then, after stage one coasts to its apogee, the parachute deployment charge will, will activate, uh, deploying the parachute and forcing the coupler out, which will be retained through the use of a shock cord. Next, the parachute will fully deploy and stage one will coast to landing. So here's our stage one design structure tree. As you can see, it's composed of five uh, subsystems, including propellant, structure, recovery, staging, and avionics. So our stage one total definition, up at the top left we have our parachute, below that's our avionics bay, and below that's our motor case. Over on the right, at the top we have our coupler, below that our fuselage, and at the bottom our fins. So first, our structure subsystem. The coupler 
made of aluminum, is what actually holds stage one and stage two together. The eye bolt connects to the parachute and screws into the forward closure, which is surrounded by the motor mount. Over on the right, we have our, excuse me, our fuselage made of uh, fiberglass, and below that are our fins, also made of fiberglass, shaped like that, so we can have maximum uh, maximum performance in subsonic airflow. So a closer look at our stage one eye bolt assembly. Up at the top, we have our eye bolt that actually connects to the, the parachute uh, and connects with a hex rod to a threaded rod, or a hex knot, excuse me, to a threaded rod, which screws into our forward closure. The forward closure allows the motor mount to sit on it, and the motor case sits in the motor mount. Here's a, a good look at our front, the front of our avionics subsystem. On the left, we have our microcontroller. Uh, to its right, we have our magnetometer and gyroscope, and below that are our linear three-axis accelerometer. On the back of our avionics subsystem, up at the top we have the firewall which protects the avionics from the parachute deployment charge. Right below it we have our pressure sensor, and below that's our temperature sensor. And over on the right, contained in a battery mount, are two batteries. And it's important to note that most of the avionics bay will be made of ABF plastic. A look at our recovery subsystem. We have our parachute, as I've said, connected to an eye bolt, with the parachute deployment charge located as shown. Here's our propulsion subsystem, with the forward closure connected to the, to the motor mount and the motor case sitting on that. Inside the motor case will be our propellant, which will burn and be forced through the nozzle, creating our thrust. Now I'd like to go over some requirements. First, the mass of the stage one system needs to be less than or equal to 70% of the total mass of the MSRS system of systems. Next, I'd like to go over the structure subsystem requirements. The fuselage component of the structure subsystem needs to have a margin of safety greater than zero for all three of ultimate compressive, tensile, and shear strengths. Now we'll go over the propulsion subsystem requirements. The propulsion subsystem needs to provide a total impulse that's between the values of 2,780 and 2,930 newton seconds. The motor case component also needs to withstand an internal pressure of 20.69 megapascals. The propulsion subsystem needs to provide a thrust a uh, thrust curve with a standard deviation of 25 newtons, and the thrust curve is shown below as a sixth order polynomial. Here's a graphical representation of the thrust curve. The first peak there is representative of the fact that we have a, a very strong initial thrust. This is to give us a large, um, a large amount of stability at the, at the start of our launch. It's important to note that at the start of our launch, we want to keep our center of gravity and center of pressure as close together as possible. Um, then we go through a a valley and the second thrust peak is what happens when we enter our second, or we start burning our second grade geometry. So here's our stage one system recovery subsystem requirements. The recovery subsystem needs to reduce the speed of the stage one system to five meters per second or less uh, on ground impact and also needs to allow for a horizontal displacement of six kilometers or less from the, the launch site. Now our staging subsystem requirements. The staging subsystem needs to generate an initial internal pressure during the stage one separation event of between the values of 6.2 and 6.5 megapascals to allow maximum separation. Now we'll hand it off to Joseph Mena to talk about the stage one system validation. Thank you, Jacob. Hello everybody, my name is Joseph Mena and I will be going over the validation of sta the stage one system. Uh, our requirement was that the mass would be less than or equal to 70% of the total mass of the MSRS and with a calculated mass of 57.44%, that requirement is numerically validated. Now I will be going over the structure subsystem validation. Uh, we did uh, a mesh in, of the fuselage in ANSYS, specifically mechanical APDL. We did three separate meshes, a coarse mesh, an intermediate mesh, and a fine mesh. Uh, the solutions all converge on the same values, uh, so we have the correct mesh, or correct, we have the correct process. Uh, here is the load, the load state of the fuselage you have the thrust, drag, and weight acting in the axial direction, while the lift in the X and Y acts to the side. 
we had a required value of a margin of safety greater than zero for the ultimate tensile, compressive, and shear stresses. And in both ANSYS and our hand calculations, those requirements are numerically validated. Further validating our structures is the fact that in max stress, max strain, and max work, also known as Psi Hill theory, the three principal failure modes of composites, we have, uh, we have values that uh, work with the required val values. Here is our load state from the top down. As you can see, you have the ultimate compressive force right here in the dark blue and the ultimate, ten the ultimate tensile for stress in the red. Now I will be going over the propulsion subsystem validation. We had a requirement for our impulse to be between 2,780 newton seconds and 2,930 newton seconds. And with a calculated value of 2,855 newton seconds, that requirement is numerically validated. We also have a requirement for our internal motor casing pressure to be less than or equal to 20.69 megapascals, and with a calculated internal pressure of just under 14 megapascals, that requirement is numerically validated. Here are the different lengths of the uh, grains that we will be using. You have the 22 centimeters of the progressive Bates grain and 25 centimeters of the regressive Finosil grain. Uh, Based off the initial simulations, it gives us this thrust curve. However, in order to validate the requirement, we will have to test this experimentally. I will now be going over the recovery subsystem validation. Uh, we had a requirement for our impact velocity to be less than or equal to 5 kilometers per second, and with a calculated value of 4.5 meters per second, that requirement is numerically validated. We also have a requirement for our horizontal displacement to be less than six kilometers, and with a calculated value of 1.2 kilometers, that requirement is also numerically validated. Now I will be going over the staging subsystem validation. We modeled our staging as a piston cylinder with friction, where there was a required pre internal pressure between 6.2 and 6.5 megapascals, and with a calculated value of 6.27 megapascals, that requirement is numerically validated. I will now hand it off to Emily Lambert, who will be going over the stage two definition. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, my name is Emily Lambert, and I'll be going over the stage two system definition. With me today is my team member, Janelle Book. Now we're going over our stage two system concept of operation. This starts with our stage two ignition, goes to our stage two burnout. From here, we will post to Apogee. At Apogee, we will signal our stage two separation event, which will lead to the partial deployment of our stage two parachute. Sometime later, we will have full deployment of our parachutes, then we will post to the ground. Here's a more in-depth look of our stage two system separation event. At Apogee, we will have a black powder charge that will separate stage two from the payload bearing. Sometime later, we'll have another black powder charge that will separate the coupler from stage two, which will produce the partial deployment of our parachute. Sometime later, we will have full deployment and close to ground. Here's a more in-depth look at our partial deployment system. When the signal is sent, our separation mechanism will cut the connection cord, releasing the, ex the extra parachute cord, having full deployment of our parachute. Here's our stage two system design structure tree. I'll be going over the structure, propulsion, recovery, staging, and avionics subsystems. Here's our stage two system definition. First, we have our motor case. On top of that, our avionics. On top of that, we have our parachute and coupler. On our left, we have the fins and attached to our fuselage. Here we have our mass breakdown. Most notable, we have our propulsion system, which comprises of 67%, which is the majority of our mass. Our total mass of the system is 1.43 kilograms. 
Here's our stage two system structure. Here we have uh, number one is our motor mount, which will be epoxy to the to our fuselage and attached to our eye bolt. On top is our coupler, and that will be our interface with the payload bearing. Then we also have our fins and our fuselage. Here's our stage two system avionics, where we have our motor mount, and on top of that, our motor mount uh, plate, which the avionics will sit on top of. The threaded rod will go through the avionics and connect to the forward closure on top of our uh, motor case. On top of that, we have our eye bolt, which connects to our parachute. Here's a more in-depth look of our avionics. In front, we have our batteries in our battery bay. And then on the left, we have our temperature and pressure sensors. On our right, we have our accelerometer and our IMU. Our IMU has a magnetometer and a gyroscope on it. All of this is held within our avionics mount with a firewall on top. On the back side of our avionics system, we have our microcontroller, and on the left, we have an open section so that our microcontroller can interface with our accelerometer and our IMU. Our avionics uh, system will be required to control our stage two ignition, the separation event, and the parachute deployments. It will also be required to calculate our uh, temperature, pressure, orientation, and acceleration. From there, we will be able to calculate our velocity and our position. Here's our stage two system propulsion made of a nozzle, our propellant, a forward closure, and a motor case. Here we have our recovery system, which will have a black powder charge, an eye bolt connected to our parachute. Now I'll be going over our stage two system requirements. The mass of the stage two system shall be less than or equal to 30% of the total mass of the MSR system systems. This came about using the Lagrange uh, techniques for optimal staging. Now I'll be going over the stage two system staging requirements. The stage two subsystem shall generate a pressure, internal pressure between 1.2 and 1.4 megapascals. Now I'll be going over the recovery requirements. The recovery subsystem shall create a, a ground impact speed less than or equal to five meters per second and also prevent a horizontal displacement of greater than six kilometers from our launch site. Now I'll be going over our propulsion requirements. The propulsion shall provide a total impulse of greater than 1,150 newton seconds and less than 1,210 newton seconds. And the ignition component shall also ignite the stage two system with a reliability of 90%. This ignition system is different from our stage one ignition system. And the propulsion system shall also provide a thrust by the following polynomial with a standard deviation of 12 newtons. Here's that polynomial. It's important to note here that the first uh, peak will be created by our finisil grain and then our second peak will be created by our base grain. For our second stage, we wanted to have more of a constant thrust throughout the whole, whole burn time. Now I'll be going over our structure requirements. The fuselage component of the structure subsystem shall have a total strain of less than or equal to 14,700 microstrain in the longitudinal direction and 8,650 in the transverse direction. The fuselage component shall also have a margin of safety greater than zero for compressive, tensile, and shear strength. Now I'll be passing it over to Unova to go over our stage two validation. Thank you, Emily. My name is Inova Book, and I'll be going over stage two system validation. The required mass percentage for our stage two system is um, less than or equal to 30%. This percentage was based off of finding the most optimal staging ratio between our first stage and our second stage to help us get to our desired altitude. Our calculated value for this was 27.98%, therefore our um, percentage is numerically validated. Next, I'll be going into our staging subsystem validation. The required internal pressure that um, the required internal pressure between stage two and the payload bearing in order for separation must be between 1.29 and 1.40 megapascals. Um, our calculated value for this is 1.3 megapascals, and that has been numerically validated. Um, similar to stage one, we modeled our stage two system as a piston cylinder with a friction force. It is important to note that with this internal pressure, we were able to calculate that the, the amount of black powder we would need in order to produce separation is 0.18 grams. Next, I'll be going over the recovery subsystem validation. The required landing speed for our stage two system is less than or equal to five meters per second. This is to ensure that when our stage two system impacts the ground, none of our internal components are damaged and that our system remains reusable. 
the calculated value for this was 3.7 meters per second, therefore this, is, this has been numerically validated. We calculated this based off of our parachute diameter, which is 12 inches. Above you can see a plot of our parachute diameter versus our descent velocity for a 0.7 kilogram payload, which will be the mass of our system after we birth our propellant. On the vertical um, dotted line, you can see our parachute diameter in meters, which is 0.3, and the horizontal dotted line represents our landing velocity, which is 3.7 meters per second. The maximum horizontal displacement that our stage two system must have with respect to the ground station cannot exceed six kilometers. This is based off of that TFR radius that was mentioned earlier, and our calculated value for this is four kilometers, therefore this has been numerically validated. Next, I'll be going into our propulsion system validation. The required impulse for stage two has to be between 1,150 newton seconds to 1,210 newton seconds. Our calculated value for this is 1,148.6 newton seconds. As you can see, we are 1.4 newton seconds shy of our required value. Therefore, this has not been numerically validated. But it is important to add that with this impulse of 1,148.6 newton seconds, we are getting the desired altitude that we'd like. For our ignition system, we must have a percent reliability of 90%. The ignition system that we'll be using will be a uh, will be composed of a nichrome wire and pyrogen, where the when heat when a current is applied to the nichrome wire, it'll heat up, which will in turn ignite the pyrogen. The pyrogen is composed of an epoxy mixture that has potassium nitrate and magnesium powder in it. While this has not been validated at this moment, we are really confident in this ignition system, and we're confident that next semester we'll be able to validate this. Then I will be going into our structure subsystem validation. For our margin of safety in the compressive tensile and shear stress, we have greater than zero, um, which is our requirement, and our strains in the longitudinal and transverse direction are all within the required range. Therefore, these have either been validated numerically or through ANSYS, and we use the same stru structural analysis as stage one. Next, I'll be passing it on to Tanu Shankar to speak about our payload definition system. Payload fairing system definition, sorry. Thank you, Nova. My name is Tarun Shankar, and I will be going over the payload fairing system's definition. Alongside working with me is Chloe McMullen. This is the payload fairing system's design structure tree. The payload, payload fairing system has three subsystems, which is the avionics subsystem, the structure subsystem, and the recovery subsystem. I'll be going more over the components later in the slides. Now I'll be going over the concept of operations. First, the MSRS system will be launched, followed by stage one separation and stage two ignition, and the stage two, followed by the stage two burnout, which will be followed by, which will coast to, which will coast to apogee. At this point, the payload fairing will separate from stage two. And finally, the payload fairing will go through its partial shoot deployment, followed by a full shoot deployment, then it finally lands. The payload fairing system consists of the nose cone tip, an aluminum nose cone tip, an ogive nose cone, and a payload fuselage, which which is comprised of the external nose cone, nose cone component, which will house the avionics subsystem, recovery subsystem, and the internal structure. This is the break, this is the mass breakdown of the payload bearing system. As you can see, the structure subsystem has the, has the most mass with a 78.45% of the total mass of the payload fairing. And all in all, the payload fairing is 10.5% of the total mass of the MSRS. The nose cone component is comprised of a nose cone, an aluminum nose cone tip to endure the thermal loading of, uh, thermal loading through the ascent the ogive nose cone, 
and the payload fuselage. The internal structure is comprised of a payload rod which will go through the avionics subsystem that will be screwed into the hex nut and the eye nut and the eye bolt will be screwed into the hex nut to reinforce this arrangement. This is to keep this is to ensure that the avionics is held in place with the recovery with the recovery subsystem inside the nose cover, inside of the payload fairing. This is the front view of our payload fairing avionics subsystem. Our avionics subsystem is comprised of a microcontroller, which is mounted onto a payload fairing mount and is attached to a firewall. The firewall is to keep all of our avionics components from getting damaged from the black powder charge. This is the back view of the avionics subsystem. We have a temperature sensor, a battery in the battery bay, our pressure sensor, gyroscope and magnetometer, as well as a three-axis accelerometer. The gyroscope, magnetometer, and accelerometer are responsible for giving the payload fairing system, for giving us the payload fairing system state data. Finally, this is the payload fairing recovery subsystem which is comprised of the, pit, the black powder charge, which is responsible for the parachute deployment and the parachute itself. Now I'll be going over the avionics requirements of the payload bearing. The avionics subsystem shall signal the parachute deployment sequence after the payload bearing reaches apogee within five to seven seconds. It shall calculate and report the altitude, velocity, acceleration, and orientation with respect to the ground station greater than or equal to 24 hertz shall function while under an acceleration that is greater than or equal to 24 Gs, and it shall function at an operational temperature between negative 40 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Now I'll be going over the structure requirements of the payload fairing. The nose cone component of the structure subsystem shall have a margin of safety that is greater than or equal to zero for ultimate compressive strength, tensile strength, and shear strength, and it shall not permanently damage, deform from a stagnation temperature of less than or equal to 260 degrees Celsius. Now I'll be going over the recovery requirements. The tracking component shall allow the payload system to be tracked within a distance that is less than or equal to 25 meters, and it shall la transmit latitude and longitude of the position of the payload fairing less than or equal to 25 meters from the location. This is the schematics of this is the schematic of the payload fairing avionics tracking system. First, the sensor data will be inputted into a modem, which will convert the data into a two-tone sound. The sound will be inputted into a modulator alongside with a waveform signal. The modulator will match up the frequency of the sound to the waveform of the signal, which will then output a, piggy, a piggyback signal. The piggyback signal is then amplified through an amplifier which is sent through the antenna and is broadcasted to an handheld receiver. Now I'll be passing it over to Chloe McLellan, who will be discussing about the payload fairing systems validation. Thank you, Tarun. Hello, my name is Chloe McClellan, and like you said, I'll be going over the payload fairing system validation. First, I'll be going over the thermal validation. So our maximum surface temperature of the nose cone must not exceed 260 degrees Celsius, or 533 Kelvin. The calculated value for this is 154 degrees Celsius, or 427 Kelvin, which validates this requirement. For our initial analysis, we treated it as a thin-walled one-dimensional conduction rod with a steady heat input. For the improved analysis, we did a time-varying heat input. Um, the nose structure was broken into 10 panels using Prindle-Meyer, and then the, stag <coughs> the stagnation convective heating was analyzed with Bayreuth. 
As you can see behind me, the Bay Riddle model with Q representing our heating rate and H representing the local heat transfer coefficient. The model relates the specific heat of the material and the temperature rate of change to the local heat transfer coefficient and enthalpy. Here's our thermal analysis of the first panel of the nose cone structure. Our initial temperature is 288 Kelvin with a maximum temperature during ascent at 427 Kelvin. The stagnation point limit is 533 Kelvin as shown by the red line. Now I'll be going over our structures validation. For our compressive, shear, and tensile stretch margin of safety, these values have to be greater than zero and these have not been validated at this time and will be completed during the next phase. Now I'll be going over our avionics validation. Our minimum temperature has to be greater than or equal to negative 40 degrees Celsius and the maximum temperature has to be less than or equal to 80 degrees Celsius. Our calculated minimum value is 7.2 degrees Celsius with a calculated maximum value of 15 degrees Celsius which validates both of these requirements. These calculated temperatures are from the 1976 standard atmosphere table. For our power source validation, the continuous discharge of the battery must be greater than or equal to 47 milliamps with a manufacturer value of 60 milliamps, and that validates this requirement. The total battery capacity must be greater than 94 milliamp hours, and the battery voltage must be between three and five volts. Our manufacturer value for our battery capacity is 1200 milliamp hours with a voltage of 3.6 volts and this validates both of these requirements. Our maximum acceleration must be greater than or equal to 24 G's with a manufacturer value of 24 G's so this validates this requirement. It's important to note that our maximum calculated acceleration is 22.8 G's. For the recovery validation our impact speed must be less than or equal to 5 meters per second with a calculated value of 3.2 meters per second, which validates this requirement. Our horizontal displacement with respect to the ground station must be less than or equal to 6 kilometers as per our temporary flight restriction with a calculated value of 4 kilometers. And now I'll be handing it off to Tyler Nolan to talk about the MSRS system of systems validation. Thank you, Chloe. I'm Tyler Nolan. I'm going to be talking about how we numerically validated our system of systems. The requirement we're validating for the system of systems is our altitude requirement, where we need to get the payload between 11,700 and 12,300 meters. In order to validate this requirement, we created a six degree simulation, six degree of freedom simulation, which included an aerodynamic model, a thrust model, an attitude model, and a changing mass moment of inertia tensor. To, uh, to the right of the slide, you can see our free body diagram for this model. For the model, we used three different coordinate frames. The first is an Earth-centered inertial frame. The second is a Southeast Zenith frame, which is centered at the ground station. And the third is a body fixed frame, which is centered at the nose tip of the rocket. For our attitude parameterization, we used a 323 Euler rotation. So first we started with a sum of forces on our rocket. We have three forces. We have the thrust force, the gravitational force, and the total aerodynamic force, which acts as the center of pressure. All of these forces, the dynamic forces, uh, are all calculated in the body frame. So when we calculate our angular acceleration, or our linear acceleration, excuse me, we had to uh, convert those in, into the Earth-centered inertial frame and propagate those in the inertial frame. We also create a sum of moments. Uh, the two moments we are uh, we're simulating here are uh, one moment from the uh, any off-center of thrust. If the action line of action of the thrust is not acting directly to the center of mass, there will be a disturbance torque. And the second is a uh, stabilizing force due to the center of pressure being behind the center of mass. The aerodynamic force will create a stabilizing moment. Using uh, that total sum of moments, as well as a dynamic term, we are able to get our angular acceleration. 
with those accelerations, we were able to get our current state and differential state, which is what we propagated in our simulation. For our aerodynamic model, we broke up axial drag into four different components. We broke it up into skin friction drag, base drag, transonic wave drag, and supersonic wave drag. All the aerodynamic forces we modeled as acting through the center of pressure, which at subsonic speeds we calculated using a Behrman method, and at supersonic speeds we calculated using theta beta Mach relations and a Prandtl Meyer function. Here's a breakdown of our coefficient of drag versus Mach number, each of those components as well as their sum. For our thrust model, we or use those thrust curves that we showed earlier for stages one and two. Here they are again for your reference. Using those thrust functions and the model we developed, we were able to create a trajectory for our rocket. Shown here is the trajectory. Uh, as you can see, we reached just under 12,000 meters, which is well within the range defined by our requirements. And we reached that altitude in just under 45 seconds. One of the, uh, one of the factors which can affect uh, the uh, altitude achieved by our rocket is the wind during launch. This uh, is uh, shown with a simulation of five meters per second constant wind in a southerly direction. As you can see, we only lose 84 meters uh, at maximum apogee. Uh, and this is still well within the range defined by our requirements. Uh, this is a, a three-axis plot of our uh, translation and velocity uh, throughout the flight with that uh, very heavy wind. Uh, as you can see, we move south quite a bit uh, during the launch. Um, however, we only move less than two kilometers before we reach apogee. Uh, each of these vertical lines here, the first dashed vertical line on the left is the stage one burnout event. The next one is the stage two ignition event. And the last one is the stage two burnout event. And now I'm going to hand things back to Gan Hee Lee, who is going to wrap up our presentation. Thank you, Tyler. So I'd like to go over our budget first. Uh, as you can see in this pie chart right here, the majority of our budget, both in the allocation and the projected costs, go to our propulsion system. Right behind that are our avionics. The projected costs and the uh, allocation match up pretty well, and we're happy with those matchups. We have a significant amount of our margin left over for future design changes next semester, so we're comfortable where we are with our budget. Our labor hours for this presentation, and as well as for the design, come up to 2,500 hours. Uh, the majority of those hours are spent in engineering and professional development, where professional development was uh, time spent by the design team working on this product in class and the engineering hours was time spent by the design team working on this project outside of class. At this point, we'd like to thank the following individuals for their help with this project, specifically Dr. Julio Benavides and Dr. Patrick McElwain, our course instructors, as well as Dr. Gentilini, who's attended all of our design reviews. I'd like to open up the floor for questions and invite the rest of my team to join me up here. Great job. Um, you know, I can tell a lot of work went into this. Um, so let's go to slide 20. So um, given that you're using uh, some, something that's already there, I was wondering how much having to work around this existing system influenced your design. Uh, did that constrain you at all, or what kind of integration risks are there in working with this pre-made system? Sure, so the biggest constraint with the launch tower is the geometric uh, outer diameter constraints. And you were lucky that it has a much larger outer diameter capability than we were even exploring. It can go basically up to one foot. Um, we were a little constrained in terms of how skinny it can go. We have to modify it just a little bit to uh, support the entire rocket, especially because it's uh, two stages. But the biggest benefit of using this, uh, this big tower right here is that it's an integral part of our stability component at launch. It's, it's very tall, so that helps us maintain a you know, perfect attitude during that launch segment to build up the speed. Okay, very good. Um, I had a question about uh, your, how you're going to verify the, all the flight components, the avionics, but you answered that later on with the 
the 24G requirement, um, is that going to be verified using uh, an ANSYS structural analysis? Are you going to do some kind of vibration test, or what's your plan for that? Right, so the 24Gs specifically from the avionics is that uh, when we're selecting components, they would have to be uh, manufacturer rated towards 24Gs of dynamics. Uh, we're interested in the vibrational and dynamic analysis just on our rocket itself, but we're not going to uh, validate those requirements on the avionics separately because uh, Overall, if we have good information about our uh, drag characteristics, our aerodynamic characteristics, as well as our propulsion characteristics, we believe that we can have an accurate understanding of how fast this rocket will air. The dynamics of the rocket will be experiencing during flight. Okay. Um, on slide 96, and this is the first time I saw this. I, it showed up a couple of times. So I was a little bit, um, it was a little bit strange to see uh, structural strength requirements expressed in terms of strain. Um, it showed up a couple of times. I was, was curious as to uh, how this came about and why you guys chose to do it this way. Sure. Uh, the biggest, the driving requirements on the structural side are our margins. Um, the reason we included the strains there is just because we have a tolerance fit between our motor case as well as our fuselage components. And so during the, uh, one of the issues we thought that we could encounter is the the expansion and deformation between those two components would be separate weights, and if those started constraining each other, there'd be some buildup of stress there. Um, that's the reasoning behind that. Okay, yeah, that would be a good thing to mention, just because that's a little bit confusing to see. Uh, it's, it's kind of an unusual way of presenting it, but now that you explain it, it makes perfect sense. Okay. Thank you. I think I only got a couple more things. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, just a general question for your structural analysis. Uh, you guys have been going pretty fast. Um, and uh, I come from the airplane world, so usually a lot of times we don't have to worry about this, but I was curious what, for your structural analyses, uh, what temperatures are you guys using? Are you using elevated temperatures, using different temperatures for different components, or at different parts of the rocket? How, how are you guys handling uh, that? So I will admit our structures analysis can definitely use a lot of improvement. Uh, we aim to follow up on that next semester. We basically used, uh, just from standard atmosphere tables and uh, typical day conditions, we just used those temperatures for all of our analysis. And while we did conduct some uh, preliminary heat transfer analysis on the nose cone, we haven't actually applied that directly to the structure either. So we really need to, we'd like to follow up on that next semester. Yeah, no, I highly recommend that. That would be really good. Um, but like I said, great job, guys. Good work. Excellent. Very comprehensive presentation. Thanks for speaking so much. You broke building quantum on the rocket. So there's nothing more exciting than building quantum your own rocket. <laughs> um, so um, I just had a couple of questions about your altitude range requirements. Uh, you stated initially that, you know, there were, that there were three altitude requirements. And yet the subsequent information seemed to suggest that you're going for the 12 kilometer <coughs> altitude. So what was the purpose of the other two? Sure, uh, so initially, I might have not been as clear as I should have been on that. The uh, customer request for proposal was for a rocket based off of primary, secondary, and tertiary objectives, where uh, the altitudes were tiered. You'd have either design for the primary altitude objectives or the secondary or tertiary. They're not so that we would be flying concurrently, where uh, if we launch our rocket and we only maintain our secondary objectives during that flight, we would not be uh, content with that. We'd just be shooting for the one that we actually designed for. Does that clear things up? Yeah. And your six kilometer um, range requirement, is that for the total flight, including descent and landing? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's just based off, now that is actually a variable that can change on the, uh, the specific day of the launch. Um, it's a requirement that comes out from the FAA based on the temporary flight restriction that's given to the launch site, and so that's what we're working with there. Okay, final question. How do you get invited to your <laughs> we would we would love to have as many people there as possible. You know, like we'll uh, I mean, keep you we definitely we definitely will. And that goes for everyone. <laughs> so really good job. Uh, really nice presentation format. <clears throat> you covered all the requirements that you needed to. Um, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, one was what drives the multi-stage parachute? I mean that's a complication that should have some real reason to be having it. Definitely. So one of the biggest reasons that we're dealing with is we have one big constraint of that impulse constraint at the very beginning. And uh, as
as a result of that, we don't have as much unlimited power as we'd like to. And we've had, in, uh, as a result of that, we had to have pretty narrow diameters for the body, both on the first and second stage. Um, but the second stage is especially, it's very, very skinny. And having more parachutes for maybe a drogue shoot or a, a, a combined with a bigger parachute would take up a lot of volume, so we didn't want to go with that solution. The biggest concern that we have in deploying our parachute at the very beginning at, uh, at, at the Apogee is that we would uh, be susceptible to drifting out of our temporary flight restriction by, based off the conditions of the wind. So we chose to use that setup as a result. I still don't understand why you have to deploy it partially at first and then the rest of the way farther down. Uh, at the end, so we're looking at buying our parachutes from a commercial manufacturer and they have a stated uh, maximum uh, opening speed of 76 meters per second. And so <coughs> if we don't want to run into that issue, we can only free fall for so long. And uh, if, we, if we free fall for however many seconds that is and then deploy our parachute to avoid that exceeding that limit, then we would still run the risk of exceeding that uh, lateral translation issue. So we're trying to uh, fall quickly a, a, as fast as possible. Right. It is then, a very complicated system. Yeah, and then the last uh, last question I had was, um, didn't really have any discussion, maybe that's not part of the curriculum, if you will, for this part of the semester, but of test methods, structural test methods, what kind of structural testing you're gonna do on the body of the vehicle and that kind of stuff. Is that something that just comes up next semester? Exactly, uh, we have put some thoughts into some preliminary testing for next semester, but not down to the nitty gritty detail. We would like to do that. Do a good job. Thank you. Definitely very impressed with what you guys have done so far. Um, as you have stated many times, this is a deceptively complex system, and there are a lot of moving parts that you're going to have to account for in the whole thing. Um, my first question comes just in general, uh, your requirements listing. Uh, this kind of jumped out on slide 60, where you note that all of your required uh, Margins of safety are just have it just has to be more than zero. Um, I was just curious where requirements like that uh, derive from. Sure. So typically, uh, right. So one thing that stands out with, from these requirements and the validation process is that we have very high margins of safety. You know, they're nowhere near the requirement there, and that really comes from the fact that we're buying most of our structural components off the shelf from commercial uh, commercially available parts. We, didn't, we decided not to put a upper bound on the margin of safety despite the fact that the rule of thumb is we want a relatively low margin of safety that's still positive. Uh, just because we felt that if we can still satisfy our altitude objectives with the mass that's coming from overbuilt components, we could uh, still accomplish our mission objectives with, despite having an overbuilt system. Okay. Um, my next question is about your, uh, your nose cone tip and your use of aluminum. Most systems I see working in an atmospheric environment such as this generally use stainless steel for one reason or another. My question is, is why did you settle with the lithium? Uh, the launch flight regulations require us to not use uh, stainless steel just because of uh, safety and impact concerns. So we went with 66-1 T6 aluminum there. Uh, we would probably prefer to use steel there as well or some of the more expensive materials if we had the budget for it. Okay, uh, that I did not know. Um, my next comment is just more of a concern about the propellant that you're using. Uh, can I assume that you're going to be casting your grain yourself, or are you going to buy it? Yep. Uh, you may want to practice with that because I have a lot of experience ca casting that kind of propellant by hand. It is not fun to work with, and it sets. It's very messy and it sets very quickly. So my my advice, especially given such a narrow setup, you're going to want to practice on that a lot because it's going to be very difficult to cast. Definitely, I'll take that. Put that to heart for sure. Other than that, good job. Oh, very, very good job. Um, just a couple of additional details. Um, on uh, page 11, when you were showing the simulation, you mentioned that you are, uh, in the first few seconds, stab stabilizing the vehicle. But I, I, I guess that is a passive thing, like keeping the center of pressure below the center of mass. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so you may want to want, uh, mention that, because okay. I, I knew it. but. Uh, the audience. Okay. Um, now on page 41 and then later on will be 81 and uh, 118 is two batteries. Why? Uh, one of the biggest issues that we ran into is if you look at the validation sequence we have quite a bit more capacity than we need for our mission uh, but our some of our components require a maximum discharge capacity for the batteries and a lot of the commercially available batteries weren't able to just uh, 
deliver that continuous discharge capacity. So we wired them in uh, parallel to increase that. Uh, oh, okay. That, that so it's increase. basically one part, part three. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then 40, 82, and 117. Um, so, um, did you decide what microcontroller to use uh, to get? Yes, we're we're looking to use the Arduino TNT. Okay. Mm -hmm. For all the three stages. Yes, that's correct. Um, now on page 60, uh, simulating uh, this type of material is very complex because they are anisotropic, mm -hmm. and my guess is you just simulated an isotropic material. We use it as orthotropic, uh, okay. but yes, okay. it's actually. So the question is more in general: Why you went with the, uh, you know, with the structural uh, fiber plus material instead of having perhaps aluminum for the structure plus an uh, outside shell or something? We definitely looked at that initially in the trade studies. Uh, it really came down to composites, uh, specifically fiberglass and 6061 T6 aluminum. The biggest thing is between the weight of the aluminum, we thought that we would struggle meeting the impulse. Uh, given the impulse constraints, we'd struggle meeting our tertiary altitudes, which is what we really were shooting for. Um, the modeling aspect is very tricky, especially given the fact that our, our, our structural modeling is not very mature yet. Um, we would like to follow that up with some experimental testing to supplement that uh, next semester, but we're not exactly sure how we're going to validate that completely, so we're sure of that. So are you planning to buy pipe already? Yep, we're going to buy pre-manufactured uh, fiberglass tubes from the... Uh, well, you could use a compressive machine and do some compressive testing. Right, right. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very good. Just given the length of our rocket, we're very concerned about the buckling that it'll be experiencing. Yeah. You may want to see that in the test. Yes. Before, <laughs> in the lab before in the house in the field. Um, now for uh, slide 136, uh, uh, no, I think 37 there, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, so the, um, actually you have already answered the question because it was related to the two batteries, so I think I'm good. Um, and then 143 and all the system of system validation that you perform, uh, did you perform this one on both configuration, meaning two stages and, and then one stage? Yes, our full configuration, excuse me, our full simulation allows for the multiple sim, uh, the multiple configurations as they happen in real time, or in discrete time. Yeah. Because the most critical part in this design is really keeping the center of pressure below the center of mass, so how did you do that calculation? Right, and so that's something that we have to expand upon. Uh, we have a, we're very confident in our subsonic center of pressure analysis. Our supersonic center of pressure analysis needs some refinement, just because we are uh, unsure about the interaction between the size of those fins and the flow field on the outside of the mock cone. That's something that we need to look further into. Um, initially, we started out with, a, for the center of pressure, we initially started out with a, uh, very big approximation of the Barrowman methods, which is just a basic component buildup. But uh, we refined that with starting at the nose cone. We did a uh, Navier Stokes analysis with the, uh, the pressure, the field distribution outside, and then discretized our nose cone into the panels um, using the prenel meyer method to figure out the pressure distribution on the nose cone. And then after that, on the fuselage, it was a little bit more easy just to do the uh, um, uh, component buildup methods after that. Uh, but it needs refined. Oh, right. Very good. Uh, and 158. So like I did with the other team, this if you divide that by 10 and by 15 weeks, it goes up, up actually to 17 hours per student per week. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>